So now the theme is LGBTQ, the traditional wisdom questioned. <clears throat> so this is one of the most uh, controversial and contentious issue, both in relationship to uh, the surrounding culture, but increasingly also with within the churches, where uh, uh, many churches now are discussing uh, what actually should be our view on uh, on uh, LGBT LGBTQ issues, and it's highly complex issues. I I want to acknowledge that from the beginning. And there are many different perspectives that are relevant to, to bring to uh, questions like uh, these. There are philosophical and ethical questions. There are biblical and theological uh, issues. And then of course there are deeply personal issues. And, and, and the, the whole question here is becomes so different if it's just a philosophical or a theological question compared to if it is a deeply personal question that affects one's own life or affects someone uh, close to oneself. Um, and, and of course, in this kind of setting, I can't deal with the many uh, personal issues that are really important. But this is a setting where we uh, which uh, wh where we can deal with more the philosophical and theological questions. So I, I just want to underline that I know there are so many more dimensions that I'm not uh, able to address uh, in this situation. Culturally, what is it that has happened in this area? Well, what has happened is a dramatic change in our understanding of the human being and of sexuality. When it comes to the view of homosexuality, I would say that even during my brief lifetime, I've experienced four different perspectives within my own culture. When I grew up in the 1960s, the dominant perspective amongst the Swedish population was still to see homosexuality as a disorder, as something that is, is wrong. Um, that would be the, the main perspective. That gradually made way for another perspective. So if it's a disorder, the, the, the majority position was then, so therefore you shouldn't uh, leave it out. You shouldn't express it. You have to deal with it in other ways than than living it out. But that gave way to another understanding, seeing homosexuality still as a kind of disorder, but since it's impossible for a number of people not to live it out, we need to uh, loosen our perspective here a bit and to see uh, same-sex relationships as a kind of emergency solution for some people. Um, they, they have no other option, so uh, uh, let them let them live that way. But still, there was a, a a view that the ideal is a male female relationship. But this view then gave way to the view that well, hetero and homo is equal. Uh, homosexuality is an equivalent variation like if you uh, prefer right or left hand, or if you have uh, blue or brown eyes, or if you are blonde or uh, red hair, it's just a, a, um, an interesting and uh, enriching variation amongst us as human beings. So let's look at different sexualities this way, as an enriching variation. So you cannot evaluate, say, one is to be preferred instead of the other, but they are on an equal level. And that has, at least in some circles, given way to the view that homosexuality is a kind of superior lifestyle. Gays have more fun. Someone who has affirmed homosexuality has really made an individual stand, has really uh, broken free from 
uh, from uh, norms of the society uh, has really become an authentic human being who is choosing their own life. So it then becomes a kind of superior lifestyle. Uh, today, um, at least in, in the Swedish culture, and I think in many places in Europe, um, uh, we oscillate between the two, uh, the, the, the third and the fourth uh, perspective here, to see it just as uh, equal variations, or maybe to even uh, highlight the uh, homosexual lifestyle. Why did it happen? How could in a few decades this drastic change in our understanding and our perspective take place? Well, we shouldn't be surprised. We shouldn't be surprised at all. It follows absolutely natural from the sexual revolution. How could anyone imagine that there would be a, 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 a hold here before affirming same-sex relationships? If you want the boundless sexuality, if you say we can create our own norms, if you say there is no design, then why not? So it's actually the natural outcome of the sexual revolution. Interestingly, it has not been argued from the perspective there is no sexual norms, therefore this should be accepted. That would be a coherent argumentation from the sexual revolution. But that is too hard to swallow for most people to really have it expressed. There are no moral norms in terms of sexuality. Therefore, we can live this way. So instead, it has been argued from another perspective. It has been argued by a number of what I would actually say a number of cliches. And it is cliches that's, uh, that's important, I think, to, uh, for us to deconstruct. So it has been claimed that it's a question of human dignity and of human rights, but that's not true. Equal value, which we do have all human beings, does not mean that all sexual actions are equally right or equally valid. We still need a sexual ethic to distinguish between a good and a bad sexual act. It's been claimed that it's uh, genetically caused and it's unchangeable. Now that is scientifically false. We know from many studies uh, done by um, identical twins with the same uh, genes that it's not genetically caused. So that's just uh, downright falsehood. It has been said homosexual behavior is found in nature amongst animals and therefore it's perfectly natural. Yeah, that's true. You will find all kinds of behaviors amongst animals, but they are not our moral role models. That's a really dangerous route to go down to make animals our ethical models. Human behavior needs to be argued out from what we are as human beings, not from how animals treat each other. Love can never be wrong. Now that's absolutely true. Love is never wrong if you define love as care for, compassion for another human being. Then love can never be wrong. It's always right to care for other human beings. But sexual acts can be wrong. You cannot identify love with sex. I'm called to love my parents, but not to have sex with them. I'm called to love my children, but not to have sex with them. I'm called to love my friends, but not to have sex with them. We need to distinguish here love in this general sense of, of caring for people and doing good against people from in which relationship should love be expressed sexually. Sometimes you hear Christians say, uh, I've struggled with this uh, in my life. I prayed about it and, and I now have peace. Of course, uh, prayer is so important. Uh, and to feel a peace from the Lord, but that is not a sufficient guide for theological decisions. We cannot just move according to our inner feeling and our, and our experience of what we think is a peace from God. That needs also to be related to the word of God where he is speaking to us. 
So this is a too easy way. Uh, and there are other cliches uh, and we need really to see through them. That our culture has accepted these kinds of cliches has mean that we have ended up in a very incoherent situation in terms of the LGBTQ. And you could add syllabus after that uh, of uh, E and I and plus C that they are. Uh... Anyhow, there are so many uh, contradictions here. Think about it. When it comes to lesbian and gays, it has been claimed that it is a fixed identity caused by genes and biology, it cannot be changed. But then they talk about bisexual, which is a flexible identity which can move between hetero and homo, freely move. And then they talk about trans, which is a fixed identity of the inner person that is independent of the body and of genes and is in, actually in conflict with the body and should take precedence over the body. And then you have Q, queer, where there's no fixed identity. Everything is constructed and can therefore be deconstructed. There is no authenticity or intrinsic me to be true to. The only thing we should worry about is forming an ego that is, quote, a work of art, end of quote. That is uh, Michel Foucault. So you see, this does not, uh, th this is not the coherent way of thinking. It's just a huge contradiction in understanding the human being and understanding sexuality. What we need is a broader discussion about where to draw the line. Everyone who starts to think about it realizes that somewhere there needs to be draw a line between good and bad in terms of sexuality. Nobody, almost nobody, accept everything that is possible to do sexually. Everyone draws a line somewhere. Therefore, we need to discuss where should the, uh, the line be drawn? What's this, the criteria for saying this is a good sexual act and this is not a good sex sexual act. I listen to my culture and the criteria are like, oh, you should follow your heart. But then of course, a pedophile could follow his heart. So then people will say, okay, okay, you should follow your heart, but you need to add some other criteria like, do not hurt anybody. Okay, that's, uh, uh, that's good, that's good. But then the pedophile says, well, I can have sex without hurting the child's body. So then people say, oh, okay, we, we need more criteria. We need consenting adults. So we need an, an age criteria here. Sex is uh, not for children, it's for adults. And it, there needs to be consent, agreement. Both persons or all involved needs to say yes, a voluntary yes, not under force, okay? This is, this is very good. I, I, I agree with these criteria, but they are not enough. They are insufficient. So what about prostitution? Well, with those three criteria, you, you have to accept prostitution. Or what about polygamy? Or what about, and there are many other things. So I think this is insufficient. It's good as far as it goes, but it's not enough. We need more criteria in order to frame our understanding of sexuality. What is missing in those three criteria is there is no connection to love. There is no connection to commitment. And there is no connection to the body. Biology is missing, including procreation. So in our culture, I don't think we are true to the reality of sex because sex is naturally connected to the body and it's naturally related to love. So I think we need to add those criteria. I think we need to recover what's called natural law. 
natural law thinking, that we start to re reflect of what something is designed for. We can think for things in just in nature, an acorn, it has the potential and is designed to become a beautiful oak, a big oak tree, it's designed for that. So are there any indications for what you and I are designed for as human beings? And I think there are. There are some indications that I think we need to listen to. There are physical indications that are relevant for our discussion, for our topics today. Namely that physically it is a man's and a woman's body, a man's and a woman's sexual organ that naturally belongs together. A man and a woman, a, a man and a woman can be sexually united, but two women cannot be bodily united with their sexual organs and two men cannot in a way natural for the body be united. So it's, here's some indication that male and female belongs together physically in terms of our sexual organs. Biologically, sexuality and reproduction is connected. If you want to think evolutionary, of course, reproduction is one of the main aspects of our sexuality. And it's only in the male-female relationship that uh, the fullness of sexuality in this way can be expressed, that the procreative aspect can be a reality. The same sex relationship is biologically sterile. Of course, in many, many other dimensions, it, it, it can be totally equal to a male female relationship, of course, in terms of love and compassion and friendship and uh, support and so on. Uh, but it cannot express the fullness of what our bodies and our biology is. And there is also a psychological dimension that homosexual relationships lack the complementarity of male-female that we value so highly in many other, uh, in, in, in many, many other circumstances. So in my view, I don't think you can say that hetero and homo are, uh, that they are identical. They are not, they differ in significant way. And I think nature gives priority to the heterosexual dimension. Now, as a Christian, I do not only look at reality, I do look at reality, but I do also look, of course, to God's word to see how God describes and defines reality. And of course, it's, a, it's, a, it's sometimes a daunting task to interpret the Bible. I'm aware of that. And we don't have time to go into a deep exegesis of, of different texts. But I just want to say that in this area, I think the Bible is quite clear. It's not uh, uh, one or two random verses, but there is a coherent picture in the biblical text in relationship to sexuality. There are five groups of biblical texts, both in the Old and in the New Testament, that says something that has relevance for this issue. The most important, and in my view it's, uh, it's sufficient for, for this issue, it's the creation texts in Genesis 1 and 2, where God has created us male and female, has called us to procreate, and has called us to be united male and female. Secondly, we have Paul's text in Romans 1, uh, where he describes God's wrath over sin, uh, and he mentions uh, 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 over 30 different sins, but included by them is same-sex relationship, which is an inversion, an upside down of God's reality, as we human beings are doing in so many different areas that we start to worship creation instead of the creator. So we turn things upside down. Uh, and homosexuality is an example of that tendency we all have. Secondly, uh, thirdly, you have the sin catalogs in the New Testament in 1 Corinthians and in 1 Timothy. It mentions different sexual sins and same-sex relationships uh, is amongst them. Then you have uh, two places in the uh, Mosaic Covenant in Leviticus, and you have stories in the Old Testament. What is, in my view is important here is that we make a priority here. The decisive texts here 
is Genesis and Romans and the, uh, and the other New Testament letters. So we should not take a starting point chronologically with, uh, in, with Genesis 19 and then move to Leviticus. We should start at the starting point, Genesis 1, and then move to the New Testament. And then we will have the Christian perspective. And then we can add that in the Mosaic Covenant, which we do not apply as a whole, and that's the reason why it's, it's dangerous or difficult to just to quote a, a certain verse out of Leviticus. Uh, but what we can read in, in Leviticus uh, is in line with what we understand from Genesis and what we understand in, in the New Testament. So you can say it supports what we know from these three basic groups of texts. So I, I think it's important that we make a, uh, <clears throat> a, a priority to the creation text and then to the New Testament texts when we deal with this issue. Now, of course, there's a, a number of theologians and a number of Christians who says that uh, uh, we, uh, there is a new and better interpretation of Romans and 1 Corinthians and 1 Timothy. But uh, uh, I don't think their case is at all convincing. Not in relationship to the text themselves, which clearly condemns sexual sins, including same-sex relationships, and not in the light of who the author of those texts uh, is, namely Paul, who was uh, a Jew, who was a scribe before he became a Christian, and we know very well the Jewish understanding of this issue from Josephus and from uh, Philo and other Jewish writers. And we know there was an absolute consensus among Jews how to interpret uh, the area of sexuality. So uh, I, in, my, uh, in my mind, there is, um, uh, there is no way to come around the... Um, the natural reading of the New Testament texts here. I actually have quite a lot of uh, more material, but I see my, uh, my time has gone. There is so much to be said in terms of, of the interpretation of those texts, but maybe we can uh, come back to that in the Q&A. So please uh, come on with, uh, with questions and uh, objections. Okay, uh, we have actually had multiple people um, ask about what do we do about marital rape? Shouldn't the church speak against the wrong concept of sexuality in conservative societies as well? Uh, thank you, very important question and I, I totally agree. Uh, I think uh, Christians in a number of issues uh, want to uphold uh, uh, certain principles, but they apply them in the in the wrong way and don't see the the horror of a uh, of a um, fallen world. So, for example, we of course want to help people to keep their marriage together, but if the man is abusing the woman or abusing the the children and uh, will not change from that. Of course, uh, uh, a woman and children can come into a situation where they need to leave that marriage. So the call to keep our marriage, there are some limits to that. In a marriage, we are called to uh, come together, man, uh, husband and wife in sexual union, but uh, there is no right, of course not, for a man to rape or uh, his wife or force himself upon his wife. Uh, uh, the sexual, uh, the sexual uh, uh, union in marriage should of course be an act of self-giving love where you confirm to each other that I'm giving myself to you. Uh, but that should, uh, of course, be done without pressure or violence uh, or pain. 
So I think that is a, uh, th that's a huge area where churches needs to speak out and we need to, um, we need to uh, help women in that situation and we need to challenge men. So I'm, I'm glad you brought uh, that issue up. Thank you. Our next question is, how do we deal or help a person who calls himself a Christian who is convinced that it is God's will for them to be homosexual? Hmm. <clears throat> um, I, I, I'm not sure there is there is a way that we can help a person out from a certain conviction. What we can do is to try to love a person, to listen to a person, um, and then talk to a person and share uh, our understanding. Uh, often, if a person say, it's God's will that I'm a homosexual, what they mean is God has created me this way. Uh, and with that, they often mean, I... I have never been anything else as far back in my own history as I can think my experience have been to be different. I've always related to uh, uh, people of, of uh, the same sex in another way than of the opposite sex. So my identity, as far as I have experienced it, has always been homosex uh, and homosexual identity. And if God is the creator of who I am, then he is the creator of that homosexual identity. I think that's the kind of reasoning that, uh, that's behind the, that person's position. And I, 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 I totally understand that, and I'm not questioning for a moment the experience. Uh, I'm quite convinced that the huge number of homosexuals uh, have had that experience. That is how they honestly have experienced their own life. There are others who, uh, who have changed their understanding of themselves and changed their way of life later on. But for huge groups, it's, um, it's been like this. And I'm not questioning that. I don't think we should. Because I, how, how can you from the outside questions another person's experience of themselves? That's... Uh, um, uh, that's not uh, possible and it's not fair. You have to listen to their experience. But then we have, of course, questions to discuss. Does this situation mean that God is the origin of a same-sex attraction of homosexuality? Now, that does not follow from the fact that the person have experienced the certain things uh, from early on in their lives. As a Christian, we think of ourselves and other human beings as created by God, but also as twisted through sins. So there are a number of things that I have experienced all through my life. And I could say, well, it's, it's part of who, who I am. That I would say, but they have not been directly caused by God. They are rather a consequence of me being part of a broken world and therefore I'm a broken person. To take an example, to illustrate this from the area of sexuality, I think, and, and uh, let me speak as a man here, male sexuality is the only sexuality I know from the inside. I know female sexuality to some degree, but only from, from another uh, perspective, so to say. From the inside, it's male sexuality, the only sexuality I can experience, of course. And I think a lot of us men would agree that as long back in our own history, we can think about our sexuality, there has been a kind of promiscuous tendency in our sexuality that, um, that it can be attached to many different, uh, 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 many different persons and many different situations, that, it's, uh, uh, that it does not care about the other person the way I know that I actually should. Should I then say that, oh, this promiscuous tendency within my sexuality is caused by God? No, I would say God has created me as a sexual being, but I am 
twisted as a human being. So there, my sexuality is not functioning ideally as God wanted, but there are other aspects to my sexuality and I'm called not to live out those aspects. So I, I think the way here is to have a conversation about the Christian understanding of man as created in the image of God and simultaneously being deeply flawed in every area of life. And that is not something that distinguish a homosexual from a heterosexual, but that is a thing that goes right through humanity, but it expresses itself slightly different amongst us, but the, the root damage is the same inside all of us.